where, where are you looking? Where is that? What's, huh? what's happening over there? This is my begin the show pose. Just tell me when it's time to start. It's not. Just hold that pose, please. Mm. So, Taylor, you want to talk about Barry Lyndon? Hey, <laughs> welcome to the talkies. <laughs> We were hey, in the middle of a show, man. This is it. The show starts now. Oh, right we, now. We actually, the show's been going. And today, today, we I'm, already started the show. I'm steering this ship, boys. <laughs> so we'll hang on to something and put on a life vest. Did now, you just look at the TV? We, there is no TV there. Stop that. Stop that. We, we watched Barry Lyndon. Oh, yes, we What's did. What's that? Barry Lyndon's a movie. By a guy, a famous director, little known mm. work of him. Uh, um, Ari Aster? Little gem. <laughs> Ari Aster? Yeah, yeah. Oh, is that uh, Adam Sandler? What's the guy's name? Uh, oh. Kubrick. Who? Kubrick. No, no, okay. no. No, Christopher Nolan. You're, these are stupid jokes. We're no. here to talk about a movie. Richard Linkletter. <laughs> Kubrick yes, Con and continues. <laughs> I'd want to point out a massive error, a huge mistake, a glaring oversight that needs to be corrected. In Barry an Linden? Idiotic move. No, by one oh. of us, namely Taylor Schofield. Oh, yeah, you're calling me out right now? I'm calling you out because we got the order wrong. Oh, hoo, hoo, hoo. We were not supposed to watch Barry Lyndon next. Dang. The Shining? We jumped all the way to 1975 when The Shining came out in 1980. What do you have to say about yourself? What do you have to say for yourself? Because you're supposed to be the super fan. Oh, my God. Oh Here's my what I have God. to say to that. I have a defense. Okay. And a rebuttal. Fine. I remember the mm. situation goes like this. <laughs> We were talking about the last handful of Stanley Kubrick movies. Mm. And I remember saying, hmm, his last few movies were Eyes Wide Shot, Full Metal Jacket, The Shining, and 2001. Mm -hmm. But then I was like, oh, wait, there's Barry Lyndon mm -hmm. and Clockwork Orange in there. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh. Yeah. But then I just got it wrong anyway. So I, I messed up. I actually don't have an excuse. I messed up. That's very big of you. To You're a huge man, that. Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. I am. I'm genuinely impressed. Does not redeem you, and I do not forgive. You do not forgive. <laughs> <laughs> do not forgive. Uh, I'm but glad, that's okay. I'm glad we brought this up. I'm, I'm sorry. I just want to clear it up. I don't Thank want our you. viewers to now get confused and just assume that we're not even going in reverse chronological well, order. We were. We're, we're no, just, no, no, we're, we decided we to. We made an announcement that we were going in reverse chronological order. Kenny, 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 listen, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, listen. That never happened. What? That never happened. Really? That's all in your head. You're imagining things. Hey guys, I liked Barry Lyndon. Barry Lyndon <laughs> is a movie directed by Stanley Kubrick. It's yeah. a period piece, 1975. Uh, known as having some of the best cinematography ever. Boom. What did you think about it? Can you go? Oh, okay. Uh, f uh, for real now. Here we go. I absolutely adored this film. And... Not not going to make any uh, you know broad brush statements I'd here. Say that was a pretty broad brush statement. But, <laughs> but I enjoyed watching this more than I enjoyed our recent viewing of Eyes Wide Shut or Full Metal Jacket. And at this moment in time, it's my favorite Kubrick film. That's um, I call that having that's that is taste right there. Mm. That's having taste. Can you imagine being like, damn, Barry Lyndon? <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine that. No. <laughs> thanks for thanks for chipping that in. I appreciate that. Thanks, uh, man. Thanks. Not, That's all. a good one. That's a good one because Barry Lyndon is an amazing movie. I was totally blown away. I loved yeah. it. I loved it. I, I was shocked it. at how much I enjoyed it compared to how little I knew about it. Like, yeah. this movie wasn't even on my radar yeah. at all. Yeah. I had seen I had seen it once all the way through, and I'd seen the first half probably, like, three times because it's a movie that, like, it's one of those movies for me where, like, I'll start it and not finish it, and I've done that a few times with it. Um, so this was the second time I watched it front to, to, and no breaks or anything except for intermission uh, where I went and made some food. And... <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was uh i liked it a lot more than i expected to like i knew i liked the movie but it was never in like even like top five kubrick for me or anything like that but it really is like it kind of blew me blew me away this time um i think that had to do with getting familiar with the characters and the period and all that because i know d you struggle with this kind of period too this piece right this, this and, and like piece, i yeah. kind of do too like i've yeah. always kind of had that like yeah the georgian era is, yeah. is a challenge for me yeah. even though i love the era like aesthetically and yeah. i i like the stories that are told there it's just like takes a second for me to get into that what has bothered you about king george era films uh not it's it's only i can't say all of them because the one that you and i watched the favorite right um, yeah still too close in that era but i loved that movie through and through yeah uh, was a, a, that one's a outlier yeah it's definitely yeah, it's a different little, movie. that's different um the uh the era itself has has this language about it that i'm just like you know i'm I'm already hard of hearing so it's like when i hear people talk about that language and then oh you just like the way they speak yeah, yeah. and that's it that's okay it. that's the only reason um i surprised loved this movie also um i have to say it's like it's high in my in my kubrick list it's it's definitely one of my favorites um this is the first time I watched it all the way through. I've, I've, I have this movie of my Cooper collection somewhere in my house. I don't know where it is, but I have it somewhere. It was cool. I rented it for 99 cents from Microsoft. Pretty cool. From Microsoft? Oh, yeah, in HD. Is that oh. in HD? Yeah, no less. Oh, yeah. Well. Yeah. Snob Hill. Yeah, I know. Well, after watching it, it's one of my... It's went up it in went my up ranks for you? too. Yeah, yeah it's so, definitely up there. It's one of my favorites. I I very much love it. Uh, I definitely want to talk about the cinematography a little bit, but before we get there, I wanted to talk about something real quick: the Georgian era aesthetic of the whole mm. piece, mm -hmm. uh, and what context I came in with it. So I told you guys already that my wife watches uh, Georgian era stuff all the time. Like sure. that's just her favorite aesthetic, and. Uh, it's hard for me to get into those movies, not just because of the language, but also because the movies that she watches, like the Jane Austen novel stuff, are very uh, subtext-driven, which is great for reading. Not so great, I think, for movie watching, because then you have to listen to every single word that they say. And you're like, okay, oh, I get it. Wow, he's doing this and she's doing that. Like, it's, it, there's a lot of things you got to read into, so you have to listen to everything. And she loves reading her movies, you know, and, and captions and whatnot uh, and that's just not my jam so yeah so i've i've gen generally not liked that kind of stuff but uh this one was very visually driven who would have thought kubrick so yeah. actually there's very little talking to yeah most of them yeah it surprised me how little talking there was yeah, yeah. that's what one thing that's amazing about this movie is it's a little over three hours long but I really couldn't say that any minute of it felt wasted. It doesn't feel slow. And no. it doesn't, like, yeah, it doesn't, part it, like, it's always engaging at every given moment, in my experience watching it. And uh, it never felt, it always felt like it was in service of moving the story forward. That's I always felt like yeah. the story was constantly progressing. And when it was just about following, like, the first half is more about following Barry Lyndon's well he wasn't Barry Lyndon then but following his journey Redmond Barry it, yeah Redmond Barry's journey and all the things that happened to him and it's about following him through these things and every step of the way that was being pressed forward and then as soon as it changes and becomes kind of a different movie in the second half it's all about just moving that dynamic forward every single scene is introducing a new point a new idea a new something forward and what's cool about that is i can kind of and with the narration yeah. i can kind of see the book a little bit where like i can imagine that this book is probably like extremely dense and there's probably so <laughs> much like detail Dude, in in it's that so book funny. the know? uh I, not about the book per se but, but what you're talking about dense mm -hmm. and being uh that uh what's his name roger ebert when he uh reviewed this movie he gave it a three and a half stars and said that or shit, it wasn't him. Anyway, he gave it three and a half stars, but some other guy was talking about how this movie is equivalent to the coffee book that you have on the table that nobody looks at. <laughs> and, oh, but, that's but it's like, sad. It, like it's big and it's dense, and you're like, oh, it's there. It's definitely, you know, substance, but. 
I mean, that's nah, too too daunting. Yeah, I don't think I want to read it. <laughs> that's funny. it's not that hard. I don't of a feel watch. it's not a it's not a challenging watch. Uh, a lot it's of people long. at the time yeah. said that like even so Roger Ebert said uh, that when it was released in 1975. Yeah, I think, yeah. Right, is that uh, the the movie? It feels like Kubrick is trying to say something with the slowness of the movie. Yeah, is what he said, and I was like, that's weird to me because I didn't feel the slowness like. Compared to all the Georgian stuff that I've seen. Yeah, but compare it to the films coming out in the mid-70s. Right, you right, know? right. Like... I mean, so... I mean, Star Wars burst on right, the Star scene Wars right was around close. then. 77, yeah, two years later. That's, that is pretty funny. I, didn't, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is a slower film. But uh, but I like that. I, I love that. I, I mean, I didn't really it. think it was that slow. It doesn't, it, that's what I'm saying, is that it yeah. never felt slow for all of all yeah. of us like but it was like a thing back yeah. then like 1975 everybody that's the only thing they would talk about and on the wikipedia article of this movie everyone said how slow it was yeah. like a tarkovsky movie is around the same time and his movies are five thousand times slower than barry <laughs> linden i watched uh, an interview with uh ryan o'neill he's the actor the main actor yeah uh he he's an awesome actor he has some great great roles he's in one of my very favorite movies uh which is what's up doc with him and uh, barbara streisand nice and he was giving an, an interview and the interviewer brought up all of ryan's previous work that was of note like of merit he's like you might know ryan o'neill from paper moon and from a love story and they don't mention barry linden <laughs> at all and i was just i thought that was that's super odd <laughs> yeah that's interesting. Well, wow. uh, how well was like? Did Barry Lyndon make money? Yeah, uh, it did. yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah, it doubled its budget. Doubled yeah. its budget. Yeah, yeah. which 20, it, twenty-two million in the box office. Yeah, at the time, eleven million they, on the production. They yeah. said it was uh, like moderate, like like it, it like it made money. Yeah, <laughs> coverage movies made money. Like it made money, not like lucratively. Although, yeah. um, what's it? The Eyes Wide Shut was his first and only movie to debut as number one at the box office. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. Eyes Wide Shut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's probably and a lot of they, they Eyes Wide Shut. They strategically put it out at a, on a weekend yeah. where it would do well. Eyes Wide Shut, to me, feels slower than Barry. Me too, actually. I think I felt that way too a little yep. bit. That's interesting. To, to, I mean, like, the, the content in itself, like, there's some parts in it that go pretty fast, but the... the uh, you can tell there's gaps between these non-submersible units that are just like that are pushing. I feel like like it feel, or it feels like it's crawling in in yeah. a, like like in there's there's a scene in what were we just talking about eyes wide shut where what's his name is walking down the street uh, and he's being followed and that scene is stretched out for quite a bit and it's stretched out for good reason but it is stretched out and it feels slow to me as opposed to this movie where the, we literally have people just sitting in a room for a long period of yeah, time. Yeah. And it feels it good. It feels good, yeah. Because yeah. every word they're saying matters. Yeah. It feels like every single thing that happens matters. Yeah. And something happens thought? every scene. Yeah. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? One of my first impulses about a third of the way through the movie, right after the, the first meeting with the... Uh, who proves to be the, the the burglar duo, right? The old man and his son, Captain oh, yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah. He sees them at the inn and he has asked for a glass of water and and the guy's like, Join us for a drink or something like that and then he goes, No thanks and <laughs> he, go, he goes and he Join us for a drink. <laughs> and he and he rides off and my impulse was Well that was a interesting but seemingly completely unnecessary yeah. scene in this movie <laughs> yeah i felt the same like, i really yeah. felt it i'm like okay yeah. <laughs> uh but then of course it was it was setting Set up. something up and yeah. then i and i quickly realized okay everything in this movie matters like, yeah. There's, yeah there's no mistakes there, yeah which which kind of kind of don't want to think that way because later when his son's like, when will I get a horse, daddy? And I'm like, oh, that's how the boy dies. <laughs> like, I immediately knew that. As soon as he said it, I'm that's like, funny. oh, well, he's going to die from the horse. That's um, really funny. I didn't I didn't have any of those issues. I, I know that that's the thing with you is that yeah. your, your premonitions. Premonitions, yeah. yes. That's what it is. <laughs> this, the spirit, the genie of movies whispers yeah. in my ear. Yeah, that's too I, bad, man. I saw a flaw. There's uh, no flaws. No, I saw one. No, Kubrick's flawless. Uh-uh. 
Impossible. Not this time. Impossible. Every other time, yes. <laughs> Not this time. There, when uh, when uh, Redmond Barry is getting in that uh, bare knuckle brawl, uh, and the, it's all handheld camera. Yeah. And he's like over his shoulder. The camera's really close over uh, Redmond's shoulder, and at the very corner, left corner of the frame, there is a shadow of the camera. You can see it. Oh. And it's cast onto his shoulder. You can see Ooh. the shadow of the camera. There's a light in a shot, too. Yes. <laughs> I thought he didn't use lights. No, Actually, he did. That's a misconception. Yeah, it's a misconception about this movie, which is uh. cool in that video that you and I talked about. Uh, Cinema Tyler. Cinema Tyler. Good. That is a great video, by the way. Watch that video. Don't I watch don't this know. video. He doesn't give enough opinions. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. He doesn't give any opinions. Yeah. Yeah. It's which makes it better. What does he think? <laughs> <laughs> but what does he think? He probably so he, likes it. <laughs> he probably likes the movie. Uh, he, uh, he points out that they used... Ah, I forgot the light name, but they used a ton of lights instead of daylight. What they uh, did was they took pictures of the rooms when they were filled with daylight and then tried to recreate the look. Uh, I forgot the dude's name, that cinematographer... But yeah, uh, used a lot of light in this movie. Never warming it, though. He always wanted to shoot cooler. But so he that... did shoot candlelight scenes with just candles. Yes. yes. Without yeah. lights. Yes. Yeah. All yeah. right. That well, is true. Kind of. Uh, like, he didn't use any fill light whatsoever, but he used uh, bounces. You know, to... There was tricks, yeah. Like, yeah. There, he'd bounce light off, like, the ceiling and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, the sensor. Like, there's no camera sensor you know, in those cameras, the film cameras that they're using, so they have to expose for celluloid, which is really, really tough, because um, low light is not a thing there. Uh, so what they they used a NASA lens, which is fucking crazy. It is crazy. <laughs> That's the ultimate like uh, factoid for yeah. this movie yeah. is that they. It's the only thing I'd ever heard of this film. Yeah, yeah. they used I, a, I didn't a, know what it was about. Or it was anything. a 0. .7, a T yeah. point zero point seven yeah. aperture. Can we get one of those? Actually, mm -hmm. um, actually, you can. You can yeah. yeah, they're actually not yeah. like you can get a one pretty close. Yeah, so, yeah, and mount it. Yeah, I'm not sure about point seven, but point like point nine, point eight, is, or is, nine yeah, yeah. is easy to come by. Uh, mm, yes. Yeah, these were lenses that were um, one of a kind that were designed to take photos of the dark side <laughs> of the moon. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and he had them basically destroyed in order to mount onto his camera like he had them crazy yeah. well and he messed up and he used yeah. uh, adapters to make it because yeah. it was only 50 mil mm. and he needed yeah. wider shots so yeah he put a, a projector lens on top of that lens which is hilarious yeah, that's absolutely wild yeah. yeah and they used candles very specific candles they spent a long time finding the right candles like the brightest yeah. possible candles. brightest they, slowest they said, burning the right? brightest slowest burning and they had multiple wicks per candle yeah. yeah and they had foils set up so that it was bouncing all the light yeah yeah that's crazy quite a, quite a lot it of is stuff. crazy it looks amazing though it looks yeah. really good yeah. it and looks that, and that's awesome why, but no one no one does it Right? No one does yeah. it anymore. There's, uh, it's pretty easy to do that now. There's one sh Oh, shit. I was just thinking of a short. Oh, my God. That was crazy. I was just thinking, like, there's a movie that does this, but it was a, it was a short that we talked about during our other show. Uh, but that encyclopedic memory is not uh, working for me right now. Okay. Yeah. Well, they, it's easy to do candlelight now. Oh, yeah. Now it's easy. It is. So. It is easy. You just need a camera like uh, A7S2. Boom, you can shoot anything. A7S3. That one too. A7 III, sorry. Anyway. Even the GH5S, pretty damn yeah. good. Let's talk about the cinematography. Cameras. Let's talk about cameras. Can, can we talk about the cinematography? Sure. Zooms. The zooms were a lot of them. There's a lot of zooms. That was the only thing that actually kind of took me out. Yeah, it took, well, it took me out like, every, oh, every time. Oh, we're yeah. doing it again. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it just felt like a, there were a lot of them. They used a, there a few, yeah. 10 there to 1. Yeah. Which is not the longest one that they've used. They've used a 20 to 1 on Clockwork Orange. Hmm. Clockwork Orange has some like fisheye shit, dude. Yeah, they have some pretty insane. It's it's because it was a, basically an indie movie, right? Yeah, it is. Yeah, more yeah. or less. Anyway, um, the cinematography. I t a lot of people cite this movie as like masterful cinematography, which it is because it's really, really, really uh, well done. Uh, but what I think they reference most is just just the fact that they use paintings to uh influence some of the shot decisions and that was pretty much it like like that that over the camera or over the shoulder shot that you were talking about like it, that's not 
that's not influenced by anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and I found out in Cinema Tyler's video that the way Kubrick shoots a lot is that he doesn't usually make a shot list completely mm. for the for the film. He gets on set, has everyone dressed up, get into their places, and start acting. And then while they're acting, he's like, "Okay, now what can I do?" You know, yeah. and then starts visualizing the movie that way, which is really cool because it's content first as opposed to shot first. Yeah. And it's also kind of cool because that goes against the common how people perceive Kubrick as a hundred percent controlling right. everything. Yeah, in right. Known. I was going to say that sounds yeah. contrary to yeah. yeah the rumors. Yeah, well, it's kind of it's cool that way though because that that really does have an effect on his films. You know, it like. You can tell, like, I really like Cinema Tyler's uh, example. He t- he talked about how the Reverend is using a a Bible while he's uh, reading out the lines, and then when he he turns the page to continue his reading, but he never looks at the book. He never reads it, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like that's not something that you can. Uh, I mean, it is something you can direct, but it's something that just happened on yeah, set. The like, actor did it. Yeah, the actor. Yeah. Kubrick was it. like, "That's good. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's let's do that. I like that. <laughs> yeah." Um, yeah, uh, as as far as the aesthetics, I, um, every shot in here was absolutely beautiful. But the, the, I feel like cinematography is like redefined for me since we've started talking about, I think movies in general, mm. uh, where a lot of people like to talk about cinematography, good cinematography, as being cinematography that tells the story the best. And I don't think that's what constitutes as good. I I want to say good cinematography is stuff that's intended. You know, and that's pretty much it. St- stuff that you're just like, like bad cinematography is stuff that I would say, I would say it's called, it's bad cinematography. When you have a shot that's just, you need to fill in a gap here, so let's get coverage, and then we'll mm-hmm. use whatever shot we, mm-hmm. we need. You know, that kind of stuff is stuff that's to fill, it's filler at that point. It's, you're not making a decision about the shot. It's pretty much the way you make documentaries. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah <laughs> but documentaries have, have yeah. an aesthetic about yeah. them, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and and for them, I think that's actually pretty, like, it's still intended in a way. You know, you're you're not choosing to not do a shot is also choosing itself. You know, it still it still has intent in it. Uh, but bad cinematography is is you know ones that are just riddled with mistakes and riddled with stuff that you just didn't intend. Didn't intend. So it's, it's it's kind of a weird term though. Because because you can have happy accidents, but but there's still decisions in there. Anyway, that's just what I wanted to put up. I just well, to put up. let's see, because um, it seems like there's a there's a, 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 that's a little different from what we just pointed out about Kubrick as being a, a, a cool thing. Yeah. Right. About him. We talk about intention. Right. Right. If he's if he's there saying like, Well, I'm not exactly sure how we're gonna shoot this, but I wanna see see you guys in action and then sort of tweak things but then as we go. As he tweaks it and then makes the decision to shoot that shot. Yeah. That he this he does. They they it also becomes about, intentional. Right. He they also talked about how it took him forever to get the first shot of the movie. Yeah. Because for him, for some reason it's just a thing. Yeah. yeah it's a block. The, yeah, the first shot on the day was always the hardest one the for hardest him to find. One to do. And, yeah. and but that makes sense, yeah. right? Because at that time he's He's giving so mm. much intent, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. So, so as opposed to like uh, the paint by numbers approach, of, exactly. Of being like, okay, we need a wide, we need the establishing, exactly. We need the mm-hmm. to, to two over yeah. the shoulders this way and that way, right. you know. It, at that point, it's thoughtless, yeah, you know. And when thoughtless is, is bad cinematography, yes, that's what I would say, yeah, thoughtful, yeah. That's we want good, thought, yeah. thoughtful, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think the way you're using the word like intention that. is a different way. Thoughtful, yeah. thoughtful. is thoughtful. a good word yeah. for it. Thoughtful. <laughs> I like yes, that. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. I love the look of this movie. I think it's just an absolutely just fucking drop dead gorgeous movie. Like it it's is. just beautiful. I would agree. Yeah. It looks older than it is. Yeah, it does to me. Yeah. I love uh the look of this movie cuz the bloom is really cool. It I is love, very bloomy. I love yeah. the bloom. Absolutely uh, love it. I like it too. I like it too actually. Yeah. I think the whole movie's gorgeous. And me too. Uh, something that they use a lot for the bloom is low contrast filter. Is that so? Yeah. Mm. Uh polarizer. Mm. Lots of polarizers in this movie. Quite a ton of polarizing. Just want to put that out there. Thanks That's for polarizing. Doing that. Okay. A little a little Who wants to forward. settle things with duels again? Who thinks <laughs> that should come back cuz I was- I thought that was why, great. Why did they I thought change that was the really rules, by the funny. Way. Oh yeah, there there was a updated version of dueling yeah. later on. Why, yeah. why did they do that? I think it's because he's now in the class of gentlemen. Oh, is that? I one? think gentlemen do it differently. 
<laughs> they actually get to shoot at each other first <laughs> one at a time one at a time yeah that's like hilarious to me <laughs> i uh i thought all the, that dueling in this movie was really like funny almost like and weirdly existential yeah because it's just, like so formal so we're like, okay, you guys have issues. Right. You have, you guys have a problem with each other. Yeah. Okay, don't, don't do anything crazy. We're gonna do the civilized. Yeah. You get a gun. You yeah. get a gun. Yeah. When I drop the handkerchief, shoot whoever best man wins. <laughs> I yeah. like, I like that they did the same thing kind of in the in the uh, military. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're like, hey, okay, if you two are gonna have a we're row, gonna form a square. We're form, a form a square. square. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we gotta do it right. Yeah. I think that's yeah. really really funny. Just, yeah. The definitions of like manhood and justification for for violence and it's, it's really yeah. It's a wholly, a totally different kind of way of thinking about things. Well, we they should, need more yeah. gun laws. We, we should shoot each other. Yeah, we should. They we need should sell this piece that way. Gun well, laws. I like. I wonder if if part of that whole idea and culture stems out of the fact that guns were so unpredictable. I think at so. The time. Yeah. Like bullets didn't even go straight. Yeah. Exactly. Because right? our balls. Yeah. It yeah. was like yeah. Yeah. go crazy. <laughs> and so, uh, so your chance of actually killing someone was a lot lower than it would be today. Yeah. yeah. But the, the other flip side of that is though is though if you do get hit, like you'll lose like a leg. You like lose you just, a leg. Yeah. 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 It's not medicine. Well, medicine won't necessarily help yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, well, the bone's broken, so yeah. we've got to cut it off. <laughs> Isn't it? I was thinking about that first duel, right? And so that first duel between... His uh, father? Redman. The That's opening the shot. second duel. Yeah. That's the second no, no, no. The first duel. I'm talking Redman's about... Redman's dad. Redman's dad? That The very first the, shot of the movie is Redman's dad. No, 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 no. Duel. Oh, you're right. You're right. Second, second duel. Second duel. Second duel. You stand corrected. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> the he, second he duel, corrected, actually. Uh, when he's shooting the general, I think it's really funny how terrified the the other dude is, and yeah. how he's like just yeah. trembling. Yeah, yeah, he's like crapping his pants. Yeah. yeah, and he's trying to give him ways out and stuff. But and then when it was all done, yeah, he did shoot him, and Barry did shoot him, and but it was uh, what was it? A bullet. Tell. Yeah, yeah, it they was called it toe. Yeah, it was toe. a toe bullet, yeah. Yeah. which basically meant it was just more or less non-lethal. Yeah, right. And that made me think. I was thinking, it's like his gun was probably a lethal gun, probably with a real bullet in it. Oh, the other guy. Yeah, and well, they yeah, gave, no, they switched what, out and that's gave what he said. Barry. Yeah, that's what, that's what the general dude said, right? He I, said he said like the plan was to get rid of you. Yeah. So you know, either you would have been dead or you would have been banned. Yeah, I think it's funny how like all situations like it was all stacked against him yeah. and he still i know, loved came out on top that whole that scenario funny. so much that i wished it was a, a bigger part of the story yeah like i loved the idea of someone fleeing their former life and like literally going into exile and joining the military to hide from the law when none of it actually happened, it was all a ruse. <laughs> yeah. Right? And the person he thought he was, I mean, at least he still had this thing to stand for. I was a man. I killed, I killed yeah. my rival so that he couldn't have the woman I loved. Yeah. And even that didn't happen. Yeah. He's still alive. He still got the girl. Yeah. You know? Like that just whole idea is just bonkers. Yeah. I think that is really awesome. That could be a whole, a movie in itself. Interesting. If, it's a fun story. If there's any uh, kind of, a uh, critique that I have of this movie, it would be that it's not uh, what I wish it was. Also, <laughs> it's uh, interesting. Yeah, I've That's, said that before. That is it, my critique of all movies I don't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like in, uh, I loved, I loved what the movie was. Yeah. I wish there was. I almost wish there was a second movie that had the same thing, but was uh, a different story. I, I like, I like the story of Barry Lyndon, but it, it felt like it was. It was just a journey in his life, yeah. you know, which is fine, but it's not really what my favorite kind of movie. That's so precisely like, why I loved it so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those just, are the kind of movies you like yeah, the most. I yeah. really, those really movies? enjoy uh, which, feeling again, feeling like I'm in someone else's yeah. life. Which is why it's, it's not so, a contrived. It didn't, doesn't feel like a contrived story. See, I like I like the contrivance a little bit more, and it's not so much the contrivance itself, but it's it's the way they decide to tell the story and i think that's one of the reasons is because i'm so visually driven you know that uh that the more what what it was the, the more crafted the story is it feels like it has to lean on visuals more 
rather than uh, the interactions between people and stuff. Uh, but I really like the first part, like you were talking about the duels, yeah. right? Uh, <clears throat> and when he ran away, and like I really dug that whole part where he's in love with his cousin, but his cousin, you know, is like, is like, oh, you're just a kid, you know. And I love that whole thing. I wish they, I wish, I wish the story was about that. Because I really liked that, and I, yeah. I I want my mind to be engaged as much as the aesthetics and as much as everything else. And it's like I really can respect the movie for what it is. I'd like to have more. I'd like to have more of it. I'd like to have some DLC, please. <laughs> some what? Some downloadable content. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I I I uh, I felt completely engaged through the whole thing. I uh, felt so locked into the character. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that's why it worked so well for me is that I I felt just like complete empathy with uh, uh, Barry. We were talking about that. I yeah. I had empathy for Barry, but man, did I hate him. I lost my empathy on the second half, basically. Oh, why? Yeah. yeah, why? He's a piece of shit. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> just, well, when did so you give up on Walter White? <laughs> so okay, so there are two things. I, I like to talk there, about that. Actually, this movie reminded me of two things. Uh-huh. The first half. Upon this watch, the first half, I was like, oh, this movie's Forrest Gump. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It kind of is. I it's get this that. character just whimsically going into situations, and there's like yeah. coincidental things, yeah. irony things involved. Happen to things him. happen to him, yeah. and he's just meandering through. Yeah. Second half, he becomes Walter White. Uh-huh. He's just like a coward, egotistical narcissist yeah. who's just a parasite to his family. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. I was like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I don't. I think Barry Lyndon is an amazing character. I think I absolutely so too. love his character. No, I just yeah, don't think he's a good person. Absolutely. Yeah, I would. I would totally agree too. It's the same with Walter White, right? Yeah, Walter White's an amazing Walter character. White. Yeah. yeah. I I um. There are many characters who are not good people that I really like. Yeah, same and, here. And yeah. identify with. Yeah. I can I can identify with like. Like the dude in uh, the founder, you know the main character. Yeah, like, totally. Yeah, like I can identify almost one hundred percent with his character, but I can also see that he's a complete asshole. Right? Yeah, and but I, I think funny. I see the potential yeah. for the same assholery in myself <laughs> and in all human beings. Like yeah. I think that's what where that real em- em- empathy connection yeah. ultimately comes from is when you look at you know a, a purveyor of ultimate evil. You don't have that kind of, of of empathy connection because you know you're not capable of well, of blowing up a planet. Yeah, yeah. But I can see myself being capable of all kind of these slippery slope borderline decisions sure. that are made, from my point of view, to perhaps bring me up to the next level in life, support my kid, make my kid have a, a better opportunity than I did. Yeah. Where that, the, I mean, I wouldn't say that makes you like the person, though. You're just empathizing. That's just empathy. No, I think it does make us alike. I think no, it no, really no, I mean, does. I, I mean, I, I don't mean like as in similar to. I mean, like as in you desire to be that person or, or look up to that kind of character. You know? Well, yeah, I never said that. Yeah. I okay, never... Well, that, that's, what I, that's what I hear when you say that you like... You like that character? Yeah. That's uh, what I hear is that I I imagine myself to be quite like that character and would like to be more like him. Uh, no, without the wanting to be more like him. Yeah. I I like cautionary tale characters uh, tend to be the ones I connect to the most. Yeah. I think. I like that though. That's because, good. That's good empathy though. Because I I fully recognize that's in all of us. Yes. That's just good storytelling though, is what I would say. Like like for example, uh Joker, right, had a very divisive audience of people who both related with and completely did not relate with. Right. That, it's that kind of bad character. storytelling. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that it's a that it has, you know, it it says one kind of empathy. Yeah. And there are some people that relate with it and some people that don't. And either of those people can like the Joker as a person. Yeah. But but yeah, I would say strong empathy is just good storytelling. Same with a uh, uh, something that Marvel movies don't have a lot of, uh, and something that I feel like very heavy movies, at least for me, really do have. And why I don't like artistic movies so much because because yeah. they don't have that empathetic thread, or at least not the way that I see it. Um, and also the reason why Breaking Bad is like the best show on earth 
uh, next to Avatar Last Airbender <laughs> because they have very, very relatable people. Yeah. Yeah. That's good storytelling. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I more identified with, um, what was his name? The Lord, Lord, Lord Bull something. Bollinger? Bull, yeah, Bull, yeah, something like that. Bollingsworth? Bull, Bollingsworth. <laughs> yeah. Bigglesby? <laughs> Lady Linden's son, yeah. first son. Yeah. yeah. Because, uh, because I got so, like, annoyed and, like, I was like, man, Barry Linden, like, that guy's just kind of a dick. In the second half, he's, like, becomes totally complacent and he's, like, feeling all high and mighty, but he didn't do anything to really deserve that. And he's just leeching off of Lady Linden and then he's just kind of, like, disciplining this son that's not even his and, and he's grown up resentful. And, and when it gets to the point where he's older and he starts, like, standing up to Barry Linden, I was just like, yeah let's see it that's why my, my favorite part of the movie was when he uh during that concert and uh they storm in with the the big that shoes awesome. honk, and they feel yeah. they fight it's, like i that love feels, that dude that feels so angsty to me it I, is I, it's I super angsty i cringe at it i loved it dude <laughs> i loved it because because i felt like the whole movie was almost at least in the second half was building yeah. up to like that moment like yeah. that moment where there's not it's just like a snap where it gets very visceral and very intense and just violent it becomes action all the way and seeing that action in contrast to like everything else that's happened in the movie where it's mostly just things playing out playing out playing out yeah. and then to see it go bad like that and see it get violent and then that has huge ramifications uh for the rest of the movie i think is really cool really I, powerful so i've I felt like the movie wanted me to see things from Barry's point of view. Like, mm -hmm. like I, f I felt like that's what this movie was, right? It's mostly from his perspective. And, yeah. and yeah. so I, I had settled down pretty, pretty firmly in in that perspective. And so I always saw that kid as a little snot, and I hated him. <laughs> yeah, I just that's didn't, so funny. <laughs> didn't like him at all. I wanted Barry to shoot him in the... <laughs> I really did. I, That's so funny that we just got on the opposite yeah. of the spectrum, sir. Well, I, mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, it's obvious that it's just part of our kind of personalities, right? Mm -hmm. And how, how old we are and stuff. Uh, for me, I didn't relate with either. I didn't feel like I felt like I felt like it was a storybook that I looked at. And I'm like, oh yeah, those are two characters that hate each other. Interesting. And that was it. <laughs> um, I felt obviously uh, I was empathizing with both, but I didn't like. I wasn't rooting for either. I felt like I was just I was just taking a taking the seat and watching what's happening, and that's yeah. pretty much it. Yeah. I felt like that too, in the sense that like I wasn't particularly like I wasn't necessarily rooting for uh, the son or whatever. But when it did happen that way, when he started did getting an upper hand, like basically, I really enjoyed watching Barry Lyndon like yeah. crumble. Yeah, like I that, I like that was too. brought satisfaction to See, me. That's something that <laughs> that's something that. Uh, Oh, you know, I really like that in what was that movie? H.W. Yeah, there will be blood. Will be blood. Yeah, yeah, there's blood. a bit yeah. of that in there too, See, like that. Yeah. It it did not at all give me satisfaction, but it was extremely poignant mm. because to me it was it was just seeing it was just seeing the inevitable, like right. like that's how I this, saw it too. And then that's why the epilogue was so powerful yeah, to yeah. me because it's like yeah, climb as high as you want, dude. We're all matter. going to be worm food in the end. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I thought that was cool. Yeah, uh, the first half of the movie, I was much more in Barry Lyndon's shoes, and I felt a lot more empathetic towards him, and more like, okay, I understand. Where so, what was the moment now. we have this conversation with uh, Breaking Bad all the time, uh -huh. right? Pe people always have their story of when they, when they leave Walter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when they leave, what do you mean? When, when they, they stop switch on Walt, for stop Walt, rooting for Walter. Walter. Oh, yeah. when you start rooting for him because he becomes like because he's evil like crosses yeah, a line. Yeah, you get to a point where you're just like, okay, I'm not a fan anymore. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So what is that point for Barry Lyndon? Yeah, like literally, like part two. Yeah, beginning, beginning of part, of part two. two. Yeah, yeah, me too. When as he's in the as, carriage when he's smoking. Yeah, yeah, and blows the smoke in in his wife's into face. Yeah, I was like, all right, you've like you you have. I, I was with you because you, you had the struggles. You went from you know swindling your way into yeah. higher echelons to crumbling all over again and going through military service multiple times over. Yeah. It was a struggle. And then he finally got what he needed. And he finally got what he wanted. And it was all uh, vapid yeah. and 
surface level and yeah. as the narrator says there's his wife only exists in the yeah. same way his paintings yeah. and furniture <laughs> right. does yeah right and yeah. the narrator again yeah, the narrator describes basically at that moment what barry has become and what's going to happen yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. the way i view a movie is i feel like i don't have the freedom to make to make that choice i understand like, i'm not yeah. allowed to say i'm not on team barry anymore yeah. because i am barry Right, I understand right? that. So, like, the feeling I have is more like, okay, I'm in over my head now, and I'm losing sight of of what's really true and important, and this is going to end badly for me. I understand. Yeah, right? yeah, that's yeah. cool. I'd say that's the same. I want to say that's the same kind of thought process that I go through, though. Uh, I just wouldn't describe it the same way. Yeah, I think. Um, I think what that is is. Um, I had a good thought. I believe you. um i yes i when people ask me like oh what's your favorite character in avatar what's your favorite character in breaking bad in anything yeah Uh, my favorite characters like i always want to say like a side character or someone else that's not the obvious main character but like yeah yeah right (laughs) because like that's like more interesting like when i'm trying to have an interesting talk but almost all the time i'm always the main character is usually always my favorite characters um because all the emphasis in the movie is put on them you know especially in barry linden all it's barry linden it's about this person Yeah. yeah and so like yeah it makes sense to go all in with that and like see it from his perspective and get yeah. enriched in or that that's yeah. what the story i feel like that's, that's and that's what the story is about. about yeah right it is about that and so yeah. like when, when i talk about like the like the founder or even Mad Men, for example like it's, it's about it's about people who are bad people but they they're doing like the best they can or whatever i love those kinds of stories because they're just interesting stories and you're going along with the empathy thread of these characters i still have a hard time even calling barry a bad person well, i don't I, I don't know if he's a bad person. I, I wouldn't say he's objectively a bad person or anything like that. But I would I think say he's extremely narcissistic. I would say yeah, and, that he's and narcissistic a, and a, a parasite to that found uh, that family. Well, but then, but then we're we're talking about we're talking a little bit more uh, subjectively at that point. I mean, uh, that's all I ever talk. That's all thanks. I ever talk. Thanks, Taylor. Thanks. No, I'm talking about in connection to to the novel, right? What the author was trying to say about this character, okay. like. Like obviously the 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 author set up a certain character. The narration at that point, the second part of the movie, was taught. It's explicitly told us that Barry had become someone that he he was not before. Right? Yeah, he's now crossed over into this new person. Yeah, and they showed the assholery of him yeah. blowing smoke in his in his wife's face. Like that's that's just a bad. That's typically known as a bad thing to do. Yeah. So popularly he's known as a bad person yeah yeah but everybody knows morals are relative yes so at that point you could argue just how about the anything. how about the family in the movie parasite they're parasites too i know uh i question if they're good or bad yeah. I, I i think they lean towards more good but they're definitely not black and white yeah. it could, well i mean cause... same with walter white i mean I, I felt like their actions are more are, are, I think they're better people are, than Barry, Barry Lyndon. I, I, I don't <laughs> say I, I wouldn't say either, but but I feel like their actions are are actually a, a more deceitful. Mm. You know. Well, yeah, I think you can. I think you can argue anybody that way. Like yeah. even Fire Lord or Ozai, <laughs> you can argue. You know, I would love to see a story of Avatar: Last Airbender through Fire Lord Ozai, yeah. Ozai's eyes, because that would be an amazing like. You know, it'd be the Joker movie. You know, it'd be that kind of thing where you see a bad person, but from their perspective. Yeah. And so they're not bad. So, like you said, moral morals are relativistic. You know, or so you can. Yeah, yeah. I think you could. Yeah. Or just I'm just. Ahead. I'm really trying to wrap my head around this whole conversation. This this piece of our conversation <laughs> because uh, I don't think it would have. I don't think I would have ever ex- described Barry Lyndon to someone else as. It, you know the very short answer of Barry Lyndon's the story of a guy who basically becomes a parasitic narcissistic asshole and yeah and then fades away and you know reaps the the, the I, I it wouldn't have crossed my mind to define Barry that way I and, mean and tell you to broad the narrator up. says that though yeah. in the movie yeah so <laughs> I'm just saying it, it's just to me that that is a a normal human existence 
yeah. that we're seeing portrayed in, in front of us. That's interesting. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Cheating, I narcissism. Think, I think if think if we if we had narrators uh, describing describing our various I'm arcs in our life. I'm not saying he's right or anything. I'm just saying that's 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 the description. If you were to describe it to someone else, then you would use his description, I imagine. That's all. That's all. All right. <laughs> uh, I think Barry Lane's a bad person. <laughs> You're yeah. here, folks. <laughs> hurts, You're my, here first. <laughs> hurts my feelings. I'm sorry. Because I was Barry Lyndon for like three You're, hours. You're, well, you were a bad Kenny, person. Kenny, Kenny. You're not Barry Lyndon. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't say that. Okay, I like you so much more than Barry Lyndon, dude. So much more. For, for me, it was, I don't like Barry, and I was like, oh, I don't like Kenny either. <laughs> so they equate. Yeah, that was the first thing that came to my head. I was like, this guy's exactly Kenny. He's shot me before. and <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't equate you. I wouldn't equate you. I didn't ask you to. You did though. No. You, you, did, you just told me to. No. You did it yourself. <laughs> just saying. Just saying. I like Barry Lyndon. That's, that's all. It's fine. I think that's okay to like a character. Yeah, it's I quite would, fine. I would be his friend. In real life. Barry's not a real person, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we should. Maybe we should move on a little bit. That's, the, the shots. What about the shots? <laughs> What about the shots? <laughs> oh, I know a shot that I loved. It Tell was me. the one when uh, they're marching into war uh, when he when he has the red ooh, coat or whatever. Ooh, and that whole lineup? Yeah, the lineup where it's a dolly that. shot. It's yeah. tight and just slowly zooms out as we dolly with it to one of them. It's like, that was awesome. Yeah, I was like, holy shit. That was great. Now, how much dolly track did they have to use? 800 and like, feet. Holy shit, that's a lot of dolly track. Literally. And, and Three cameras on 800 feet of track. Damn. Yeah, that's right. Because then they cut out. Because they had to, they had a wide wild. and a, yeah. <laughs> that, that is crazy wild. wild. Yeah. Well, I think what boggles my mind the most about this movie is this just huge scale, tons of effort and attention to detail and money spent. It's not a small budget for 1975, um, and. Uh, Kubrick, right? It being Kubrick himself on what seems to be a fairly like like what I think on a surface level would be an unexciting right. piece of right. of IP. Yeah, it's not like mm -hmm. entertainment, right? Only it's like it's like a character study. Like the whole of yeah. of all of its parts has turned into something that's very special. Yeah. But for someone to be like I want to make an epic, beautiful and and just masterpiece out of this novel right of Barry Lyndon <laughs> just seems bonkers yeah, yeah. and that just yeah. that just goes to show how Kubrick makes his movies yeah right? well, that, it's not like you said he's like producer a producer, producer extraordinaire yeah. yeah and it's like it's not even necessarily about the book itself that he chooses to adapt like right. the book is just the seed see of the movie you know see that what you just said I think is something that I can relate with so much about Kubrick is that there's so many people, so many analysis, film analysis people that look at Kubrick's creations and be like, can you believe all this amazing uh, symbolism that he's put in everything and so much thematic uh, connections and everything. And though some of that stuff might be there, I'm fairly certain he's producer first vision second. I think that he loves the idea of movies and that he creates this big, big movie. And sure, he'll put in some like not so stuff, like like in uh, Eyes Wide Shut with his crazy ass blue jails, right? The, the crazy light or or the rear projection walking. Like it's it's really interesting little pieces to put in there. But as far as someone who's so concerned with the amount of symbolism that's in a film, I don't think he's that kind of person. No, he's not. From what I'm understand, yeah. Um like he's very conscious of like themes and all that and they, it's almost more like he chooses the book based on the theme more than mm, anything right, mm. right well like he chose full metal jacket for example yeah you know like he he wanted to create that kind of piece and same with barry Lyndon. he wanted to create napoleon first he wanted to create a historical piece yeah and it's it's just it's, and he uh, found material that was su that would supplement exactly that yeah and further I, that end and for that for that viewpoint i i just I just don't like it when when people equate him with someone who's who's uh, 
as if he wrote the story basically you know as if he was the one who decided this story is what it is because he mm. didn't you know he he's not a writer i mean he he does he write writes some, some of it he but writes, like he writes it for the screen but he doesn't write the point of the story he doesn't he doesn't do that yeah kind of stuff and so i just i think i just don't like that viewpoint of him that's all he picks and chooses what to do with the book story-wise yeah some he'll go and elaborate on things that are totally different that's like stephen king hates the shining right you exactly. know because it's not necessarily the book exactly. it's well, just same with 2001. a kubrick movie same, you know? with, 2001. same, same with full metal well, jacket actually 2000, 2001 yeah 2001 space Odyssey. yeah with uh arthur yeah he, that no, was he also didn't want didn't want it and same yeah. with full metal jacket the, the, yeah. the dude who wrote short timers didn't didn't want it didn't care like <laughs> That's interesting to me. Yeah, an enemy to authors. <laughs> yeah, because he his, he doesn't uh, he doesn't have any uh, sacredity. There's no nothing sacred about the books he's adapting to right. him. Right, they are malleable uh, tools more or any, than anything in his eyes. Um, yeah, he yeah, I think Kubrick is like an underrated producer, or at least not underrated, but like people don't think about how much he produces his movies it's always director first yeah but he's always hand in hand producing all wanna, of his movies i want to say he's an overrated director underrated visionary that's, that's what i would say because i don't think i don't think dick because because visionary in my head is so much greater than directing and directing is a very is a craft i think a lot of people use that term synonymously in context of stanley kubrick okay in yeah. then okay yeah well then i well then yes no. <laughs> <laughs> well then nothing yeah because uh, while i think you're saying it's true at the same time i don't think he could could have successfully pulled off the same movies if he had produced and hired a director no yeah yeah, yeah, yeah totally yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, i don't know actually because i i think it's one position for him that's how i no, see no, no, it too. that's definitely yeah. how i yeah. see it that's definitely how i see it. I, I just think it's interesting that Kubrick can also, you know, take something of a story and be like, okay, well, we're going to glaze over that part, but really look at this part, but then glaze over this next part or whatever. He's not saying what the story was in originally written for, but instead his translation of yeah. it. And I don't want to equate that with the writer itself because the material is different. Yeah. It's, it's just It just becomes a different thing. Yeah, I, I think he looks at... Uh, as source at source material as materials right as like as just like i have this idea for a movie but i i'm not going to make characters and arcs and and all that stuff that's not yeah. the kind of yeah. grunt work i like to do right give me a box full of characters and places right. and relationships yeah to play with and play with yeah. yeah i think that's I, him i think Definitely. you're totally right yeah i think yeah. that's completely accurate. which which yeah. it's got to make an author feel like crap yeah totally yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> even though he's not making yeah. any judgment on the work itself yeah. you know yeah like he he loves the book the shining like yeah there's no I don't know if it's why he made the movie, you know? yeah. even though it's a much different movie than the yeah. book. Uh, Paul, Thomas Anderson ha Paul Thomas Anderson has this awesome story he tells um, where he got to visit the set of Eyes Wide Shut while they were shooting it, and he got to meet Stanley Kubrick briefly. So this was 1999. This was right after Boogie Nights came out and was a mm. big deal for him. And uh, Paul Thomas Anderson says he only got to meet him briefly, Kubrick briefly, but he noticed that he that Kubrick was instantly had more respect for him once he found out that Paul Thomas Anderson also wrote his own movies that he was the original screenwriter for his movies yeah. that and not just a director that's that Kubrick then was like oh all right you're you're legit and gave him a little bit more respect I thought that was interesting interesting yes yeah, yeah. wow well, what more can we say about Barry Lyndon? Barry Lyndon, more like three hours of snoozing. <laughs> <laughs> I was riveted. Me too. While I slept. I was not riveted, but I enjoyed it quite a bunch. Not quite riveted, bunch. though? Not riveted. Mm. I don't know. Maybe. Mm. The way you and I look at movies are different. Is that true, though? Yeah. I don't yeah. know about there that. There are a few scenes that had me like actually jumping out of my seat a little bit. Yeah. Okay. I'm definitely not that way. Let's no. let me ask you this then. Yeah, yeah. Because this reminds me of something I wanted to talk about. Was was there a moment in this movie that 
that was that you would qual- classify as the most powerful moment. Because again, I'm trying to get your yeah, sure visually driven mind. The last the the last uh, shootout that got you the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it said I feel like all the actions that took place were so slow and said so much about each character. Yeah. Um, the the way what's his name's loading the gun, the son, you know, the way he's shaking, the way he throws up, you know, th- starts to throw up and then runs off to go throw up. Yeah. You know, to make sure that he's not trying to make a big scene yeah. of it, but he is. Yeah. Uh, the way what's his name, uh, Redmond is staring at his son the entire time, never breaks eye contact with him. Uh, the way the other guy is saying each step, even though the steps are already, uh, like what do you call it? Um, everyone knows. Everyone knows it, and the the way he's directing all of them, like it, he's trying to make it so much more formal than it is, and it's that that whole scene gets me pretty good. That, that is an amazing, an scene. awesome scene. Yeah. yeah, that really is an amazing scene. Yeah, uh, but yeah, that would be the strongest moment for me. Yeah, and visually, you would say that uh, the way it was shot had to do with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the the reason why the the reason why it was that way for me was because of the way it was shot yeah like had that been one big wide shot i wouldn't yeah. have been able to tell barry's eye contact i yeah, wouldn't yeah. Have been able to tell the the you know difference between the space of of the sun running between vomiting over here and over here and it's like that kind of stuff is really pops out to me which i know by the way is not like the way i'm interpreting it is probably not the way kubrick intended for it to be interpreted as, as all artists are, you know, they make something and then people will interpret it whatever way they desire, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, yeah. Yes. Most powerful moment of the movie. I have two. Yeah. Uh, the fight that breaks out yeah. between Barry and his son, half son, yeah. stepson. Uh, and then uh, the last shot of Barry Lyndon as he enters the carriage the on freeze crutches frame? and it freeze frames. Yeah. <laughs> that would, that did I it for me. It yeah. Shot. I was like, Oh dude, <laughs> that's fucking crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like on crutches. He got one leg and it's just that yeah. back. He's halfway in. Yeah. It's like, Doom. I thought that yeah. was the cheesiest shit. And they're just like, we don't know what happened to him after this. Yeah. Yeah. I love freeze frames. That, that felt so 1975 to me. Uh, yeah, that that was kind of tipping its 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 era. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Which it, it was cheesy for me because it's visually not interesting to me. It was. I loved how it made me feel. I like it. It was like super impactful. Yeah, like it hit me right in my. What, what gut. do you think? What like do you right think? as it froze? I was like, pff, what do you think? It, it hit you so good because of how far we've come with Barry. We've watched a large portion of his life yeah. and at this point he's basically at his lowest and his most like shameful <laughs> and we don't even get to see like his face it's from yeah. behind and he's like halfway into the carriage and then it's the last shot and we just hold on that image the image of him entering the carriage with one leg crutches hunched over don't see his face it's all his back the fact that we hang on that image specifically mm-hmm. is what hit me more than anything and then to my own little like even more get deeper is uh i assume that that person was a body double um oh for because, the one leg thing yeah because I, I was wondering how they even did because i don't know how they would have pulled off the leg thing right. unless his leg because like from the front you could have his leg yeah. really tightly yeah, wound one shot but it, yeah. and then they cut behind and his leg would be there Wait, did they cut yeah they cut i thought it was one shot they cut I thought it was one shot. So, say <laughs> say it is a body double. I think it's like meta ironic that the last shot isn't even Barry Lyndon. Like it's not even that guy. Not even the actor who is entering yeah. the carriage. I dug the funny. the freeze frame. Yeah. Because it, to me, it it, it we've been watching a motion picture right <laughs> through this, and it was like. It was like, that's the end of the film we yeah. have on yeah. Barry. Yeah. There's no more. We can't follow him any further. This is the end of the story. And so we get to the very, very bottom, and he's going off potentially to his next chapter of life, but you're yeah. done. Yeah, this it's is all you over. get. Yeah. It's all well, you get. Like Something yeah. I think I would have liked to have seen instead of a freeze frame would have been if he got into the carriage and it drove off 
and the shot just hung on the empty space after that like that would have been really powerful to me that's cool yeah yeah that probably would work that's cool yeah, yeah. i think you're a better at this i'm better than uh what's his name is <laughs> yeah. yeah way better than yeah, what's his way name better than what's his fuck name. what's his name yeah anyway <laughs> uh so the shootout that final shootout was yeah. just breathtaking yeah. i loved it and the fight that's also awesome scene but for whatever it's still hard for me to completely describe why but the two moments that got me the most just like excited yeah was when the original lord linden has his argument with barry and then it turns into his heart attack oh yeah yeah that that is that whole sequence was yeah excellent and the the dude's performance of suffering through his heart was like so visceral it was like uh edge my helpless that yeah yeah that was that did it for me big time and then literally like strong emotional response was the smash cut to the funeral parade dude with the music just dropping hard right as the as the casket comes forward and the minister dude reading his prayer was just excellent cinematic moment yeah same yeah yeah i I would totally agree that'd probably be another one i'd mention yeah the whole sequence of of their son dying and them being by the bed and then cutting to that coffin stuff like seeing the kid like grapple with death and stuff like that you you know it's interesting it it reminds me of uh of the first movie that i made or that I, i was art director on we and i edited the movie too and there was a part where we I cut from, there was a fight that broke out with this guy who was jealous. Dude lays, like, is unconscious on the ground. The other guy is, is like, standing over him. And smash cut to funeral, <laughs> to, to gravestone. And the first thing that I heard from an audience member when we showed that to the people was, wait, what? Well, is he dead? <laughs> like, like, it was confusing to them. And it's seen, when I look back at it, as such an amateur moment. Uh-huh. That smash cut, yeah, because because really there was no intention for that smash cut. It it was we have no footage between here and here. That I got to cut to that next, right? So that's what I did. Uh, so I can see the the difference between yeah. someone's uh, the smash cuts that you're talking about uh, to the funeral. I think that was excellent cinematically, like you said. But I wonder what makes the difference between that and a student film or an amateur doing the same thing. Yeah, I th- I think I think one of the things it, it wasn't to me it wasn't the reveal that the son had died. Yeah. Because that was clearly he was dying. We knew we knew the son was dead. Yeah. Right? That was happening no matter what. Uh so it wasn't that the shot was used to reveal and then he died. Sure. Uh it was more like it, it was more used to reveal the next step on Barry's story, the next step on his path. And I think that's, you know, this, this piece of Baroque music that they keep using as Barry's theme that, uh, rec- starts off the movie, ends the movie and recurs throughout, yeah. um, is, is really Barry's theme and they drop it heavy right when they cut to that scene. It wasn't a tribute to the boy. Hmm. So, so what, what would you say then made it so visceral? Oh, yeah. It had nothing to do with that a boy died. It, it, well, it so, had to so do, it it had to do with the, uh, the, just bringing us to this new emotional low for, for Barry. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It was, that, it was that, just seeing the image of, yeah. of, of where Barry is now. Yeah. You know. So you linked it back to the main character. That's pretty Completely. cool. Completely. That's yeah. pretty cool. I also think the scene that precedes it gives all the context for the shot itself. Well, for me, as we, as, as Kenny just said, I didn't read that the same way at all. I, I saw it, confirmation of a dead boy. And I was like, oh my God, like that smash cut made me feel really low. Like you said, emotionally low, but it wasn't, wasn't for Barry's perspective. I was mm. just thinking, oh damn, t- t- kid's dead. Well, there's no saving him. Wow. So I, I thought it was interesting that it was... I think like, if we cut to funeral... Yeah. And honestly, I think the biggest piece of this was music. Yeah. I think if you had just cut to funeral without music... 
than it still would have done it for me though it was boy is dead yeah but with that music specifically sure had been married to every key to moment Barry Lyndon, yeah. of barry's story that's interesting yeah. they use all kinds of crazy music in this movie but yeah. that theme came back at each step I that's think cool. that that's cool. kind of thing is like one of my favorite like end results that cinema can produce and give to an audience is a shot like that where I felt like the preceding scene up to that cut made that cut as powerful mm. as it did mixed with the music itself. The f- I loved how like we knew the boy was going to die so it, it wasn't that kind of reveal and it was just sitting with Barry Lyndon and Lady Lyndon as they're like in denial of yeah. their own son's death while their son comes to terms with the death yeah. and is trying to work out heaven and like, oh, maybe I'm okay if I go to heaven. There's just some kind of justification there. He's wrapping his head around it. And then the, how emotional that scene is and then cutting to that shot of the funeral happening with that music sting also on top of it yeah is so powerful yeah um it's sort of like the i feel like that's like the pinnacle of cinema like i I aspire to do like moments like that is what i want to create i want to be able to like set up a whole movie like a movie for a moment right it takes the whole movie to build up to one moment sort of a thing which I kind of felt like there's a few moments like that. It, that, that. I don't think the whole movie build up to one moment in Barry Lyndon, but there's a few sequences that all build up to one quick moment where that one moment is just a huge emotional payoff that wouldn't have been possible if it was that moment yeah. isolated. That was this movie. Yeah. That was what it was, that yeah. top to bottom. Yeah, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, like like long burning fuses. Yes, exactly. Leading up to certain moments. I didn't find mm-hmm. big releases in the movie except for except for that one shootout for me. But yeah, uh, and the whole thing like like when I described it as a journey, you know, as as no 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 real goal except for it's, uh, we're gonna follow this guy during his life. It never felt like we were reaching a climax and then release. It never felt like that to me. It felt like a it felt like a three hour journey i felt like there were times where that happened i'm not necessarily saying that like, yeah. there was one overarching yeah. thing yeah. it was just certain sequences built up to certain moments definitely There's, i would definitely agree with yeah, that yeah there are these like are these just like beautifully like just cinematic moments that are sprinkled throughout the movie what do you mean by the term cinematic cinematic i think when i say cinematic what i'm saying there is like all all aspects of the movie making process editing cinematography production design directing yeah. performance that they all came music, together to do something all coalescing in perfect harmony to further the story or create an impact of some sort right and so that's what i mean if i can draw a comparison uh there's another very famous period piece with a very similar story moment uh gone with the wind mm-hmm. um which I don't think is nearly as powerful as this movie. <laughs> um, but the Rhett Butler, the father figure, purchases a horse for his daughter, who then falls off the horse and dies, right? And in Gone with the Wind, it's literally... Spoilers for Gone with the Wind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that movie got canceled. The well, movie's banned. We're good. You shouldn't watch it. <laughs> no. uh, uh, in, in Gone with the Wind, it's just like, oh, sad. That's sad. That the that the kid died from falling off a horse but it's literally it's literally she rides her horse you hear the sound of of falling and screaming and then the dad runs holding the child and then they're having a funeral for the child and it's just like oh that's sad that that happened let's move on um exact same thing yeah happened but not nearly the Emotion, yeah, that you get in Barry Lyndon, not yeah. even close. Not nearly the emotion that you two felt, yeah, because yeah, because yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that because it. There's another movie, Atonement, that I think does amazing at, de- at delivering its story, yeah, uh, for uh, for emotional just peaks, just absolute crushing emotional stuff in that movie. Um, and one of the shots is this. Uh, this stuff that's going on outside there, there's a conversation happening that's very important 
by a fountain and you don't get to hear what what they're saying but you know how important it is uh because of the circumstances and the context that built up to that moment and to me that felt extremely poignant whereas uh most of the stuff in this movie and and barry Lyndon didn't didn't feel uh as poignant it felt it felt important it didn't feel poignant to me well, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, then why are we even here? <laughs> you know, actually, I was thinking about that a little bit. Why, what? <laughs> about the existential, I, I know you guys are tired of, of it, me talking about talkies as an existential thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I nailed it here. I think it's because you two are so close together of your, of your enjoyment with movies. Because both of you really like the same stuff. We're different. Bit. No, you're the same he, person. He, he thought Barry Lyndon was a piece of shit, and I liked him. I think he's a hero. You, you two are very similar with the things that you like in movies, and the reasons why are very similar, too. Or at least you can identify with Taylor a whole lot more than I can when, when it comes yeah, to those Yeah, it's things. our blood. So, I think that's probably the reason why I have a, have a little bit of a distance here. Because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do the same things. I don't like the same things. We all know this. I know. But, that, but that's why I have a problem with it. We know that. I know. We've known it for a long time. I know. I know. <laughs> We've had this conclusion. Absolutely. Do you know what I want? Huh? What do you want, man? You want me to like something of my own and you want you to like something of your own? I, I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> no, no, no. You should just treat the show how, how, however you want. Wow. That is uh, eye-opening. I, my eyes are wide shut. Treat the show however you want, but keep it to yourself. You know what I like? Yeah, keep it to yourself. You know what I like? That's actually really good advice. Uh, you know what I like about Eyes Wide Shut? Mm. Is that the title isn't what you expect. You expect it to be Eyes Wide Open. That's what I thought. I was like, oh. <laughs> what how, does that even mean? How could eyes be wide, what wide shut? shut? What does it even mean? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I was going to say that the title of the book, Barry London, uh, is called The Luck of Barry Lyndon. Uh, I think that's a way better title than just Barry Lyndon. It's more descriptive of what the movie is. It is. And I had, had that been in my head contextually, I think I would have liked the movie actually a little yeah. bit more. Really? Yeah. I would have found that a little... A uh, little more contriving, right? I wouldn't yeah. like that. Yeah. It's because we think of movies differently. Yeah. Who would have thought, right? Will you stop saying that? <laughs> it's just implied. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love pointing it out. I love it. Jeez, uh, what kind of pizza is this? I, I, I can tell you what like, kind of pizza. I can tell you exactly what kind of pizza this is. I almost feel like it's impossible to give pizza no. ratings. No, to, to movies. To, to, we to all we all know Kubrick's. this. Taylor. To Kubrick, Taylor. We all know yeah. this. You've said this every episode for every Kubrick one. Yeah, it's, like, it's impossible to. <laughs> it's the, it's the best. It's like cover. it's like when Anthony Fantano does Classic <laughs> Week. At the, every year he reviews Classic. Oh, he yeah. doesn't rate the albums. He gives them Classic out of ten. Anyway, I'm texting someone. Do you mind? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just wait till I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God. Regardless, pizza. I'll still give a pizza rating. Go, D. Okay, this uh, is very, very easy for me. <laughs> Make it good. I'm it's hungry. Not, it's not going to be good. Uh, it's, it's a rock? No, okay. it's a rock. <laughs> it's a. Uh, <laughs> it's a. It's what I order over at. Uh, uh, blaze pizza mm. it's a it's a uh, sounds delicious it's a great crust you know your, your regular crust you got your white sauce mm. you got your white sauce mm. you got cheese mozzarella and you got um gargonzola oh. fresh fresh mozzarella on it Ooh. and then you top it off with salt pepper and basil mm. I was just on you the whole time. <laughs> mm. 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 Well, I had good reactions. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what it is. Okay, it's okay. That. Oh, topped with maybe some pesto. Yeah. Oh, that. Yeah. I don't know about you, but that sounds like you adored this movie. No, yeah, it was really good. Yeah. 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 Uh, really good. My pizza rating is the exact same. Wow. Like literally. <laughs> wow. Like I even like, but I, before you even started, I was saying I was like, okay, I'm gonna think I'm gonna go blaze. <laughs> on this wow. one yeah i think i'm gonna go blaze white sauce pizza on this one and then you started saying i was like oh well yeah <laughs> exactly all right i think it's fair to note though that never mind 
<laughs> okay, okay. I, I'll tell. I'll, I'll give you the reason why I gave it that uh-huh. pizza rating, though, is because uh, yes, the pizza is delicious. But on top of that, it's uh, it's no frills. You know, mm. it it it's mm-hmm. just a plain good pizza. You know, one of those things that somebody says, "I want I want a good pizza." This is what you serve them. Is that mm. you know you don't you don't be like. Don't give me any of that really crazy shit on it, you know? Yeah. Don't make anything spicy. I just want I just want to have a good time. See, and for me, like, I never want anything spicy or any of that extra good shit on my pizzas. Mm. And so, like, that pizza you're describing, mine doesn't have pesto. Uh, is basically just some of the best pizza that could ever exist for me. Well, there you go. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. What is yours, What's Kenny? your pizza rating? Oh, it's simple. Simple. To it's a simple white pie? sauce it's pizza. A white <laughs> sauce pizza. <laughs> yeah, like you, just, you walk up to the counter and you say, "Hey, I'd like a deep dish mm-hmm. uh, corn meal crust mm-hmm. wow. pizza, yeah. topped with uh, fresh mozzarella, sweet corn, and caramelized onions." And uh, they bring it to you in a three-cornered hat. And uh, when they give it to you, you're like, "Why is this in a three-cornered hat? This offends me." And so you duel. Oh. Uh, okay. Oh. You win the duel. Sure. Win the duel. You eat the pizza sitting yeah. on the corpse of the man you shot. But, twist, he isn't dead because <laughs> you shot him with a fake bullet, a non lethal round. Uh, and in the end, he gets up and eats the rest of the pizza. Okay. I have a question for you about your pizza rating. Sure. So, let's say everything's the same. Mm-hmm. What movie would this be? Everything about your rating is yep. the same, yep. except when you shoot the other guy, uh-huh. you miss, he shoots and kills you. What yep. movie would that be then? Oh, that that was <laughs> definitely, without question, that is um, uh, Rear Window. Rear Window. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. I take offense to that. Rear that, Window is one of my favorite movies of all time. Are you saying that's good, dude, that's or what? That's great. That's a great rating. To, to die? To die? <laughs> sure. <laughs> What? I had things as bad pizza rating. You guys, oh, wait, you guys no, are going to die? <laughs> uh, we all die. Humans die. No, I understand, though, oh because God. you're dying for the movie. Yeah. That's you're, beautiful. You're saying that your death is part it's of part the enjoyment. part of the pizza rating. Right. That's beautiful. Okay. That, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's actually Rear beautiful. Rear Window's excellent. It is excellent. Jeez. Yeah, I'm glad we talked about Rear Window. <laughs> yeah. Well, you asked me what it was. So I, had to <laughs> I was curious. Yeah. I wanted to know. It's definitely yeah. Rear Window. That makes sense. Now, if I was if I was very badly wounded but didn't die <laughs> what movie like, would that like be? let's yeah, say what movie would that let's be? say it hits uh, one of my lower vertebrae i become paralyzed from the waist down yeah that is birth of a nation oh yeah because that, oh, yeah, that yeah. kind of no, just sucks yeah. and it's racist yeah but it's very important cinematically <laughs> while being while extremely being very, bad very, and racist yeah right <laughs> wait what does racism come out of the Huh? So what kind of pizza is racism? <laughs> racism. Pizza. Uh, it's probably, a pizza made out of wood with termites in it. Yeah. You know what? That's what it is. Oh, say, so it it's a wood, uh, termite infested wood crust <laughs> with um, sawdust. With sawdust. As and the also there is. Sawdust is the cheese. Oh, there, the sauce is, no, no. There's actual cheese on there, but it's cheese that's ugh. been left out. It sounds worse. It's been left out for months. Like the cheese is yeah. way moldy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Completely moldy. That's racism. Yeah, that is what racism that is. Racism. Is. Yeah. Um, if, you're, if you're a racist. <laughs> oh, man. Jeez. Did that just ruin our YouTube rating? Yeah. Yeah, we Sorry. can't put that on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, we can't put that on YouTube. Thank you for taking that back. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> now we can put that on YouTube. Now it's on YouTube. Yeah. Mm. We don't approve of racism. We approve of racism. <laughs> Birth, Birth of a Nation is an important film, cinematically speaking. Also, we and, love uh, it because uh, of thematically, how cool it was with yeah. all the racism. <laughs> yeah, I really related with it. I was like, I, yeah. I was like yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, I was like, I really had well, strong I, empathy. I relate with every main character of every movie. So. <laughs> then don't watch racist movies, man. Be Dang. careful. Gotta be careful. Uh, okay, uh, what are we gonna do next? What oh, yeah. movie? Well, we have to Should do. Should we go do Shining? Yes, now? We have to do we the got, Shining. Do, let's just skip it. Let's just, <laughs> just yeah, skip let's it. We already passed. We it. missed it. I want to stick with the order. So, yeah, Shining. Tune in next time. We're going to talk about the Shining. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. It's gonna be interesting because 
I haven't seen the movie The Shining in like 20 years. And I've wow. actually never seen the whole thing. Probably. Damn, so dude. Good. I've mm-hmm. seen The Shining like 10 times. Since seeing it like 20 years ago, I've read the book like 10 times and I'm obsessed with it. Like I love that book. Mm. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting viewing experience for me. That so will be interesting. It's going to be a whole episode. different context. Yeah. yeah there's gonna, this, this, this episode. Well, it's a three-hour movie. What do you expect? It's got to be a long episode. Right. There's an equation. Oh, shit. Yeah, an hour and a half. Damn. This is a feature. Okay. We, we typically, our episodes okay, are bye. Okay, bye. a third to a half of the running length of the movie. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense, actually. <laughs> yeah. Weird. Bye. <laughs>